Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In his will, Benjamin Franklin left 1,000 pounds sterling each to the cities of Boston and Philadelphia. In small increments and at low interest rates, the money was loaned out to tradesmen who wanted to start their own businesses. Franklin estimated that with compound interest, the trust fund would grow and both cities would end up with large windfalls by the end of the 20th century. University of Pittsburgh professor Michael Meyer, author of Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet, discusses Franklin's micro-lending scheme and assesses its legacy. Michael Meyer, your new book about Benjamin Franklin has this phrase in it appearing several times. Each generation discovers Benjamin Franklin for themselves. What is it about Franklin that makes him such an enduring character for Americans? Well, it's sort of in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? There's something, because he's so multifaceted and because he did so many things, um, I think it's easy as as generations proceed or as different types of people look at his story to draw inspiration from him or question the things he did or, as in the case of this book, look at his legacy that others have not looked at quite, quite strongly. So a little bit about you as we get started. You teach nonfiction writing at the University of Pittsburgh. Is that right? Yep. And what number book is this for you? This is number four, following three set in China. You have an interesting origin story on this one. So tell me it, please. (laughs) So I was, uh, I spent over a decade in China. I was one of the first Peace Corps volunteers sent there. And then I stayed on and worked as a journalist and a writer And when I got back to the States, I was invited to the State Department to a state luncheon for then President Hu Jintao. And someone had told me they always invite one writer, don't invite two, because then the writers will complain. But one, you look, you know, you care about culture, you look classy. So I bought my first suit off a rack in, in Herald Square and got on the train and went down to D.C. And I walked into the State Department. And if viewers know what the State Department building looks like, it really does look like a chewing gum factory from the outside as a critic fumed at its unveiling. But when you take the elevator up and step into the diplomatic reception rooms, it looks like something out of a movie. And we're talking honey colored herringbone wood floors and Paul Revere silver and those heavy curtains that always catch on fire in movies. And I looked around and there was Yo-Yo Ma playing his cello and there was Barbara Streisand chatting with Colin Powell and I felt very out of place. And I stepped into a side room to sort of collect my thoughts and catch my breath and to mop the flop sweat off my brow. And I put my hand on a piece of furniture and a voice from behind me said, don't touch that. (laughs) I said, oh, I'm sorry, is it old? And a Marine guard standing at the wainscoting said, that's the writing desk where Benjamin Franklin signed the Treaty of Paris. And Honestly, my first thought at that moment was, what's the Treaty of Paris again? And I I, I started talking to the Marine about different aspects of Franklin. He's considered the founding father of the Foreign Service because he had spent 27, uh, his last 30 years overseas and so forth. And I went back to the luncheon and I sat there and felt really stupid for the next hour because I thought, I know intimate details about Chinese emperors and Chinese dynasties, but I don't know the origins of my own country. And so when I went back to the hotel room, I did what one does. I started Googling and I fell down the Franklin hole, you know, click led to click. And eventually I read his last will and testament and it blew me away. And I thought, A, how do I not know any of this? But B, how has no one written a book about this? And you know, I I know it's time to write a book when the book I want to read doesn't exist. So as you suggest that this is not a full on biography, but it really is the story of his will. The exact title of your book is Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet, The Favorite Founders, Divisive Death, Enduring Afterlife and Blueprint for American Prosperity. We're going to have a lot of time to dig into more of the details, but just give me the thumbnail sketch of what he did with his will. He settled scores and he made sure that for at least the next 200 years, Americans would be talking about him and the lesson he wanted to set. So in short, um, not only did he divide his estate up between heirs with lessons attached to each of those gifts, but he left two pots of money, um, one to Boston and one to Philadelphia. And essentially, you know, he was a, a forerunner of microfinance. He said, these pots of money are to be lent to young tradesmen in order to start their own businesses at 
small amounts at minimal interest to be repaid over 10 years. And then at the centennial and bicentennial of my death, I want Boston and Philadelphia to come together and decide what to do with a slice of this money. And he predicted that it would result in a windfall. Well, maybe to cut to the chase, uh, were his ambitions successful with his wealth? <laughs> it depends, I suppose, how we measure it, right? Any, I suppose any dollar we invest that's still there 200 years ago, accounting for inflation would be a success. It was a success, but not in the way that he thought. And I think not in the methods that he thought. You know, Boston and Philadelphia, two very different cities, uh, both in 1790 at Franklin's passing, but certainly during the Industrial Revolution and post-Civil War and into the 20th century, managed his money really differently. And what was interesting to me, you know, following the, the book follows the sort of horse race between these two funds and these two cities and what they're doing with Franklin's money. One city adhered quite strictly to Franklin's idea about, you know, loaning the money out to tradespeople. One city said, no, I think it's better if we look to that 100 and 200 year payout and try to accumulate as much as we can. And so in a nutshell, you sort of have what offsets American philanthropy from how it generated in other countries, right? American philanthropy's idea was, has always been from the get-go, it seems to be, you have a sum of money that you both want to accrue more money on that principle, but you also want to be doling out portions of it annually. Um, and so sort of haphazardly by accident, I think Boston and Philadelphia illustrated that tenet of philanthropy. So before we get to some more of the details, uh, how long did you work on this project and where are some of the places it took you? It was about a decade in total, and I spent much more time than I thought I was going to spend on it because I ended up going into, you know, great Boston archives, the Boston City Archives, which are located behind the West Roxbury Home Depot, and the Massachusetts Historical Society, which is in much tonier quarters um, with beautiful wainscoting and, 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 and lighting and windows facing the fence. Uh, Philadelphia and its city archives, and also the American Philosophical Society, which was founded by Franklin the Library of Congress, our National Archives, over to London to Franklin's uh, only existing house that people can still visit on Craven Street near Trafalgar Square, and then up to Ecton, the Northamptonshire village from where his father emigrated. So it took me much further afield than I thought I was going to go, but it was a wonderful hunt. You know, really, the joy was in the process, I have to say. Well, before readers get to his afterlife, you do give a lot of details about his biography. So I wanted to share some of those with our, our viewing and listening audience. He was born in Boston. Uh, what were his early years there like? Well, he was born to a man who had fled England. He was a con believed in congregationalism and felt that he couldn't freely practice his religion under um, the king's rules, you know, to join the, the Church of England. And so he was an immigrant, but he was a skilled dyer. He was a, fabri a skilled fabric dyer. And he, when Josiah Franklin showed up in Boston, he left, you know, the, the capital of the Western world in London and showed up in a town that was only 10,000 people where they grazed their cows on the common. And Franklin's father soon realized, I'm not going to make a living here selling, you know, fine cloth that I've tinted. And so he became a candle maker and a soap maker and was sort of a public utility. Some estimates say that Franklin's father supplied one third of the candles being used in Boston at that time. Uh, and his mother was the daughter of an indentured servant who had um, been bought free of her of her um, indentures on Nantucket Island. And Franklin was one of 17 children growing up in a small house on Milk Street. And then they moved over to Union Street. Um, he only had two years of formal schooling. Schooling was free, but his father could not afford the, the textbooks, the school, the materials. And so he apprenticed to his father. And, you know, in his autobiography, he sort of says like, oh, I, I didn't take to the job of making candles. <laughs> but, but when you look at what horrible work that was at that time of, you know, rendering tallow, you know, boiling down uh, cow fat, uh, cow uh, organs, I should say, into fat and making candles. You know, Franklin very much wanted to escape that life and um, loved the sea, was quite a strong swimmer. He'd swam in the mill pond. He, one of his early inventions was swim fins so he could swim faster. Uh, prolific swimmer. 
But he ends up getting free of his father by agreeing to apprentice under his brother James. His brother James is a printer who goes on to found the newspaper, the New England Courant. And Franklin learns his trade as a printer starting at age 12, but then quickly runs away from his brother um, and ends up in Philadelphia. Why did he go to Philadelphia? I think uh, <laughs> by chance, frankly, I think he wanted to go to New York, he says in his memoir, um, but he ends up, the boat doesn't make it to New York. They end up um, foundering on a shore, spending the night cold, shivering, wet on shore and go on to Philadelphia. And he ends up in Philadelphia and he immediately realizes, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore, proverbially, we're not in Boston because he walks into a baker and this is perhaps apocryphal, but Franklin said this in his memoir, that he was so hungry and he walked into the first baker he saw and he asked for biscuit, which was like a biscotti type bread they had in Boston. And the man said, well, we don't have that here. And Franklin said, well, give me a three penny loaf. Thinking again in Boston, three pennies would buy a loaf of bread. But in Philadelphia, you bought, you got much more for your money. And the man gave him three <laughs> round rolls of bread. And Franklin said, you know, he wandered up Market Street with his dirty clothes in his stuffing out of his pockets and with one uh, loaf in his mouth and two loaves of bread under his arms. And he thinks that the woman who would become his wife, Deborah, saw him sauntering up Market Street at that time. Um, and so for her, it, it decidedly was not love at first sight. He looked quite comical and disheveled as he made his way into his the town that would you know make his fortune. You write that Benjamin Franklin purchased the Pennsylvania Gazette at the age of 23 and made it into the most read publication in colonial America. How did he do that? Well, he had help. And this is a something that, you know, we'll, we'll touch on this later with his will. And I think he did want to differentiate himself from his fellow founders with his will and the bequests he made. But one thing for sure is that Franklin was not a self-made man. I mean, he, he certainly worked hard and he, he admits this in his memoir and in his letters. You see how diligently he worked. But his his wife, Deborah, you know, her family had a shop that he lodged above on Market Street and through them, he received, he and Deborah moved into a piece of property that they owned. Um, he inherited their property after Deborah's mother had died. He had a partner that, you know, took to drink. Um, and fe Franklin felt that he was harming their reputation by, by gambling and, and drinking during the daylight hours. But there were Philadelphians who stepped forward and said, look, we'll help you buy out this partner so you can have your own business. So he had to start with that too. And prior to all of this, you know, Franklin as a young diligent worker caught the eye of the then colonial governor who sent him on a ship over to London bearing letters of credit, he told Franklin, um, and that would allow him to buy a good printing press for the colony. But when Franklin arrived in London, he realized there were no credit, you know, no letters of credit in the sack that was being emptied out on the ship's deck. And so he was marooned in London. And so he really had a second apprenticeship as it were, of working his tail off for a year and a half in London to earn his passage back. So again, by the time he, he had the Pennsylvania Gazette, he had a lot of experience and also a lot of help to get to that stage. If uh, one visits Philadelphia today, you can go to a place where National Park Rangers will do a demonstration of Benjamin Franklin's printing press. We pulled a little clip of that for our audience to see. Spread that around. You can see there's just some ink on there. Oh, nice. So, so this is how Ben himself did it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he spends, you know, really his whole life in print. He starts very young as a young boy. This is definitely a big uh, part of his life. So roll it under, and then, of course, we want to press this. So we're going to do that once. And what? Michael Meyer, printing was a, a really a, a labor in, the, in that period of time. About pr uh, printing, you write that he benefited as a publisher from both the slave trade and the abolitionists. Can you explain that? One of the fascinating things about Franklin to me is someone, you know, researching him deeply for the first time was how duplicitous he could be. It's often, you often, when you're looking at his letters or looking at his life, you want to go back in time and scream, don't you, does one hand not know what the other hand is doing? And this goes all the way through his life. And other people have remarked 
upon this too, especially during the Revolutionary War, where Franklin became friends when he was in London previously with Grenville Sharp, a, a leading abolitionist, and one of his Philadelphia neighbors, Anthony Benezet, was a leading abolitionist in the colonies. You know, early on as a printer, Franklin, we'll get to his slave ownership after this, but I will say early on as a printer, he profited from slavery in that he he accepted classified ads for slave auctions, for slave sales. He ran advertisements seeking runaway slaves for their recapture. At the same time, he printed, you know, Pennsylvania is and certainly one of the first American colonies anti or abolitionist tracts um, by an abolitionist named, named Benjamin Lay. Now, Franklin did not put his name as printer on the title page of that tract, but he did print it. Did he own slaves? He did. And this is the other maddening thing about Franklin, that people always, I think we often think of him as, oh, he's so far ahead of his time. He was very much of his time. And I think as a school child, I thought of slavery as something that happened on Southern plantations. But you find that slavery was rampant throughout the Northern colonies as well, because enslaved people worked as servants. They were, and Franklin called his enslaved workers servants. Um, they worked as, you know, in livery and stables and so forth. Franklin called his enslaved workers, uh, or enslaved people, I should say, servants. His family intermittently owned at least six over the years. And although there are letters where Franklin says, I, I do not like the practice, or I've had a problem with this, he still never freed one of the people he purchased in his lifetime. Um, they either died while they were in captivity or they ran away unpursued by him. But this is another myth about Franklin. You know, oh, he was a self-made man. He became wealthy on his own. Well, one of the reasons he became wealthy is because he held people in bondage that did free labor for him. But you say that over the course of his lifetime, he became an abolitionist vocally. He did, and maybe too little too late, but he did lend his name to the cause quite vociferously toward the end of his life. And again, this may have been the effect of his abolitionist friends in London or in Philadelphia. It may have been his wife, Deborah, telling him that he should back uh, education movement, you know, to create uh, schools for um, Africa, children of African descent or, or children of slaves or freed black people in Philadelphia at that time. Or it may have been because he finally saw the hypocrisy of saying we're fighting for the cause of liberty, but I myself am still holding people in chains. And so when he returned to Philadelphia after serving as, as the American minister to Paris, 1785, before the Constitutional Convention begins, he's elected president of the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery. And he does start lending his name to the cause quite vociferously. Now, historians debate, did Franklin actually write the petitions and the letters um, to say Northern governors saying you should stop create manufacturing ships that are being used in the slave trade? Or did he simply sign his name to these tracks? That's debatable. But it is true that after the Constitutional Convention finished, the first petition calling for the abolition of slavery submitted to Congress was handed in and signed by Benjamin Franklin. When you describe Franklin as a man of the Enlightenment, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, I think of, you know, it's the age of reason. And so after, after his retirement at age 42 from printing as an active printer, um, he really devoted himself to scientific experiments and later diplomacy. But prior to that, you know, he we can get into his philanthropy and his charitable works. But one thing I like about him is that he'll admit, for example, that, yes, I did found the first library in the American colonies. But no one benefited more from that library than I myself, because through this, I studied all these great scientists and free thinkers and and philosophers that he later met when he was in the UK or in, or, I'm sorry, Great Britain or in France. But, you know, his, his career as a scientist and a, and a diplomat began after his retirement at age 42. And that leads us to the famous kite experiment, but other, you know, other inventions he did, which ranged from the Franklin stove to bifocals to the swim fins, swim fins I had mentioned to a new and improved catheter which he made for his brother James, but then writes to him, I fear it might be too large. You know, the reader sort of puckers when they read that. He perfected the odometer. He made a better rocking chair. I mean, the list goes on and on. I say in the book that when you start looking into Franklin's life, let alone his death, 
it really does feel like you're, you're pulling at a kite string that just keeps pulling at your feet. A little more about his family because they become part of the, the will later on. Uh, he and Deborah had how many children? Three, uh, two to, well, I should say three, two together. We don't know who William's mother was, his firstborn son. It was likely a prostitute, but William called Deborah nothing but mother throughout his life. Uh, when they were wed, it was a common law marriage. When they moved in together, uh, William came with them. Well, Franklin omits that fact in, in, his, in his memoir. And they had a daughter, Sally, and they had another son named Francis, or they called him Frankie, who died when he was four of smallpox. But William and Sally survived. Uh, uh, Frankie, one note that's contemporary, uh, Franklin had a positive view of vaccinations because of his son's death. He did, and that was a sea change for him as well. I mean, one thing that's interesting about Franklin is he changes his mind a lot, and he admits when he was wrong. And I think uniquely, the older he gets, the more progressive he becomes, or at least a little more open-minded, I should say. Um, When he was an apprentice for his brother in Boston, he and his brother in their newspaper mocked Cotton Mather's campaign uh, for inoculation. Uh, Later, though, when he was in Philadelphia with his own newspaper, Franklin went public and said, you know, I think that inoculation is a good thing. And there's rumors spreading right now that my friend, my son, Francis, my beloved son, died because we inoculated him against smallpox. The fact is, we weren't able to inoculate him. He was ill with dysentery at the time. We felt he was too weak to, you know, um, to receive what they called the transplantation. Um, and he died of smallpox. But I urged the public to believe in inoculation as a, as a positive force. How would you characterize Deborah and Benjamin Franklin's marriage or common law marriage? Well, you know, I think Deborah gets a real short shrift throughout history. And I, in the book, I talk about this, that it seems to me when you look at the shelf, when you face the shelf of Franklin biographies, I mean, the wood is actually sagging, right? There's so many of them. And when you look at them, I think Deborah is often assigned a walk-on role in this blockbuster production that is Franklin's life. And I was shocked, you know, when you look back at uh, most of Franklin's biographers are men. So, you know, and, and I'm obviously a man as well. But at the same time, I grew up with a single mom who's in construction. And I saw a lot of similarities in what Deborah did and what my mom did when I was a kid. My mom can read blueprints and price a job. I can't do that. When you look back at Deborah's ledgers for their store they had on Market Street, she is calculating, I mean, various sundries, everywhere from barrels of mackerel to coffee to chocolate. Philadelphia is a bustling port. She's selling and trading these things. You know, obviously the American dollar has not come into fruition yet, and people aren't even using British pounds for most of their exchanges. They're using South American currency and silver and gold. They're using Mexican silver dollars. They're also using British pounds. You can look at her ledgers and how quickly she's calculating these different transactions and giving change in different currencies. She managed their real estate portfolio for the many, many years when Franklin was away. Um, She had a very active social life on Market Street, both with her family and also with Christchurch, where she subscribed and had a pew. And so I think oftentimes it's it's written, you know, that, well, Deborah was not willing to go to England with Franklin or Deborah was not willing to travel overseas with him or go back to Boston. I don't think Deborah really wanted to leave home. You know, she had a horrible crossing as a young girl from England. when Her own family migrated to Philadelphia. She had a deathly fear of the sea. And I think anybody who's been an expatriate knows that the worst role to play often is that of the trailing spouse, especially when someone, you know, a transatlantic celebrity like Benjamin Franklin was to show up in London and be in his shadow. Instead, Deborah, I I see her more as she chose to stay home where she had family, where she had friends, where she had a business to run and where she had a church that she belonged to. And Franklin, you know, a lot of what we know about Deborah comes down to us through Franklin's memoir. But again, in the book, I point out for the fact that Franklin wrote that memoir when he was 65 years old. You know, four decades plus had passed since their courtship. That memoir begins, Dear Son. And I don't know about viewers, but I think any parent writing a memoir addressed to their child probably isn't going to write a romantic valentine to their kid's mom or or husband in the book. Um, But, you know, in the book, I endeavor to let Deborah speak as much as she can. So many of their cor- so much of their correspondence has been lost, but what remains, she reveals herself to be witty, capable, brave. You know, there was a time when the Stamp Acts were um, 
were issued in the United States, or the colonies, I should say, excuse me. Franklin is in London, and an angry mob descends on their Market Street print shop because people in Philadelphia think that Franklin is conspiring with the Crown to have these, the Stamp Act passed. And Deborah, rather than you know running away, she says, I called my brother and told him, bring your gun, and we set up a magazine here. And I made sure that I barricaded the door, and we sat upstairs, and waited out until the crowd left, the mob left. And, you know, all of a sudden there's a sea change in the letters that Franklin is writing back to Deborah at that time, you know, and instead of my beloved wife, the the next letter begins, my dearest Debbie. And they often had a very jocular, I think very loving exchange back and forth, but they were separated by an ocean. Franklin's celebrity grew. In the book, I said, you know, it's, it's lovely to read his handwriting. It billows across the page, you know, he's just, He's these ballooning B's and F's and they slant. And so when you're reading Franklin's letters, it often feels like, oh, the ship, you know, this, this correspondence is blowing its way across the Atlantic back to Deborah. And he signs those letters often B Franklin. And when he's witty and loving, you know, that signature sounds like a command B Franklin, be like him, but not in his correspondence with Deborah toward the, the latter part of their marriage. And, in fact, you know, he's not with her. She's waiting for him to return to Philadelphia and he's putting off his return and she suffers a stroke. And she very, I think, heartbreakingly writes to him like, I don't want to cause you any trouble, um, but this has happened to me. And he still doesn't come home. And so she dies in Philadelphia. He never lived in the house that she built for them. Uh, he never lived in that together with Deborah. And we'll come back to her with his own death because I think he, he tried to make amends for that in his will. Uh, we, you mentioned earlier that you, met, you visited Ben Franklin's house in Trafalgar Square in London. Uh, we have found a little bit of video we're going to show just to give people a sense of place with that. This is the only house that's still standing, not in Boston where he was born, not in Philadelphia, which was his adopted city, not in France where he went after he lived in this house for a number of years, but here in London. This was a proper house for him. He lived here for a long time. Yeah, initially between 1757 and 1762. He comes back again in 1764. He doesn't leave until 1775. So it's the better part of 16 years in this very building. Michael Meyer, and those missions to London and Paris, because we've got to fast forward through Franklin's life. Sure, I know. Well. <laughs> uh, when, when did he stop being a loyal servant of the crown and become uh, philosophically a revolutionary? He was called before, you know, he, that's a good point you said, because he was a very loyal servant to the crown and his son, William, you know, was appointed the governor of the colony of, of New Jersey. Um, and they would have a great falling out in the Revolutionary War because of that. Franklin is called into what was called the cockpit in Whitehall, which was a, <clears throat> a room that Henry VIII had actually used for cockfighting. And there he is upbraided for over an hour um, because of the colonial the colonists sort of recalcitrant attitude toward the stamp act and governance you know uh, that that they are, are clamoring for independence and more of a voice and the crown feels that franklin in fact is not their loyal agent is not in fact acting in the interests of philadelphia or pennsylvania and massachusetts before the crown but in fact franklin is a turncoat because it's franklin who's leaking letters from the massachusetts colonial governor thomas hutchinson one time ally of franklin um telling the crown and the the colonial ministers that maybe a little more control is needed in massachusetts and so franklin is essentially called to the carpet and stripped of his Most important, a a post that he held so dear, he was deputy postmaster of the colonies and a post that allowed him great privileges, including free mail services, but also the right to freely circulate his Pennsylvania Gazette newspaper. And so he walks out of that meeting, essentially, a meeting in which he says nothing, stands stock still before the cat calls and the upbraiding he's getting um, from the servants of the crown and the Privy Council and really walks out of that a rebel. And it's within a few months, the intolerable, what's known as the intolerable acts are passed and that cements his conversion to American patriot. All the while telling his son, William, I think you should resign your post as colonial governor of New Jersey uh, because things, a, a wind is blowing a certain way here and William refuses to resign. <laughs> 
So we're going to fast forward to his death so we can get to his will. He dies sure. in 1790 at the age of 84. And uh, you say that he was, at that time, the most famous American and, of course, the first of the founding fathers to pass away. Uh, how was his death marked? I'm going to ask you to contrast three places. France, where he had served as a minister uh, by the citizens of Philadelphia, his adopted hometown, and by the government of the United States. Three opposite ends of a triangle, right? So he dies in 1790 in Philadelphia in his home at Franklin Court, and immediately the enconiums pour forth, right? There, Philadelphia at that time had an estimated 28,000 people. They say, I, how can we count this? But the newspapers at the time said 20,000 of them turned out for his funeral four days later. Um, it was the largest crowd ever gathered in what was then America's largest city. In contrast to that, in the uh, national capital of New York, news reaches New York four days later, the, the funeral is being held in Philadelphia, and the government, the federal government doesn't really know what to do. Uh, the Ho House of Representatives passes a motion to wear badges of mourning, a black armband. The Senate, meanwhile, which was provide, presided over by the Vice President, John Adams, who was a, a nemesis of Franklin's of sort in his life, decides we're not going to do anything. And George Washington rejects Jeff, Thomas Jefferson as Secretary of State's entreaty that he should wear a badge of mourning. Washington says, well, he didn't die on the battlefield and he didn't die in office. And if we start now, who knows where that road is going to lead? Now, famously, George Washington's would become the first state funeral on his own passing in 1799. But in 1790, when Franklin passes, there is no state funeral. And in fact, the first official eulogy would not be read in America for Franklin until 11, nearly 11 months have passed since his death. And only then the man chosen to read his eulogy was a man Franklin loathed, a man who had completely tarred Franklin's reputation in Philadelphia and was the one who had said in print that William was the child of a servant woman who Franklin completely ignored and died penniless and so forth. So very uh, huge contrast in those two ways of remembering Franklin. Meanwhile, across the Atlantic in Paris, Franklin is revered. I mean, the death you know, sends the city into a paroxysm of, of, of great mourning and one of the authors of the Declaration of, of Human Rights stands up, or the Declaration of the Rights of Man, excuse me, stands up before the, the, the what was called the National Assembly and says, you know, Franklin has died. And it's a, it, he declares a state of mourning of three days and people are supposed to wear black. There's an assemblyman named Robespierre um, who is very upset by this because he doesn't have a black coat. And so he's gonna have to borrow a larger man's black coat so we can picture for a couple of days the architect of the reign of terror stomping around Paris in an oversized black coat. Uh, but there are, you know, public memorial after public memorial, everywhere from the Academy of Surgeons, the Royal Academy of Surgeons, to the Academy of Sciences. Printers have their own memorial service for Franklin in Paris, and they stand up and they say, one printer said, remember that Franklin said that it is not shameful to be born in poverty, but being ashamed of it is shameful. And as this man was giving his speech about the importance of a free press to a republic, people behind him, printers behind him, are setting his words in type and then running them off a press almost, simult almost simultaneously and then rushing copies of that eulogy around the streets of Paris. And I thought, when we, when we step back and consider things from Franklin's perspective, that probably would have been the memorial that impressed him or gladdened him most. For briefly, uh, with the reaction in the United States, was it driven by politics or, or what was the reason for uh, so much divisiveness over how he would be recognized? I was, you know, sort of, I was amazed, but maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but at the same time I thought, well, wow, this really has echoes of our present day divisiveness, right? The roots of it start at the very beginning of the federal government. Um, you know, it's political and personal, I guess, both, like many things are, I suppose. Um, on the one hand, you have a faction that's going to become the Federalists, who are very distrustful of Franklin's, um, his, his time he spent in France and the love of the French for Franklin. They sort of, you know, the Federalists at that time were tampering down Franklin's calls for a unicameral 
uh, elective body. They were thinking, you know, we shouldn't have direct democracy. Beware the mob. Their arguments sort of bear themselves out in the French Revolution that is occurring almost simultaneously or is just starting at this time. At the same time, they want closer ties with Great Britain. And so they're suspicious again of Franklin, the, the love that the French are showing Franklin. And when Franklin had come back from Paris, you know, the government did not reward him the way they rewarded John Jay and other ministers. You know, Franklin was very upset that they were making him, they would not pay his grocer's bill or his wine merchant's bill in Paris, or that they were requiring him to pay his own postage when he was writing back to old friends in Paris about, about government affairs. So there's that. And then, it's, of course, it is personal because John Adams is presiding over the Senate and Adams and Franklin had a famously, you know, fra fractious relationship. So there's that as well. And, you know, in the book, I there's a, a Pennsylvania senator named William McClay. And I quote extensively from his diary where McClay says too, like, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Franklin. I thought he could be a, a bit egotistical, but I could not sit in the Senate and believe that they painted the devil so black and that Adams, he said, sat there. He said, I don't know how to say this word in English, but the Scotch Irish have a word for it, smudging. This sort of smirk smile on his face, this self-satisfied look, as Adams both refused to officially mourn, call for a, wear badges of mourning in the Senate. But later, when the, national, the French National Assembly had sent their, you know, they sent a large envelope over with reports of all the memorials that had taken place in Paris and an official letter of condolence, Adams refused to read that out loud to the Senate. And, you know, Washington, too, didn't quite know what to do with that. They were still sorting out what the divisions of power were. Um, and so he actually deputized Alexander Hamilton to respond to that official letter. It was just very fractious, you know, and at the end of the day, I can I can conclude this section just by saying that when the U.S. government, the federal government finally did reply to France. It happened to be Washington's birthday in 1791. And that night there was a dinner in Philadelphia. And as they were, the Federalists were celebrating Washington's birthday, Philadelphia's tradespeople who were at the dinner um, and the Jefferson, who, the people who would become the Jefferson Democrats, Jeffersonian, Jefferson Democrats, stood and pointedly raised the toast to the memory of Franklin and to France. And so, so those seeds were sown pretty early on there. So to his will, um, we, we need to get to, as you describe it, the most enduring aspect, which was his, his scheme for uh, microfinances. Uh, but you referenced in the beginning of our conversation that he used his will to settle some scores and promote other members of the family. What's, a, what's an example of that? Well, you know, he made, he made a pointed... Uh, so, he had a very fractious family. So again, I mentioned William, his, his firstborn son, remained loyal to the crown and ended up in exile in London. And Franklin made sure he knew his will would be published. And so he made sure that the first beneficiary in his will was William. And he said, yeah, he deserves the estate that he endeavored to deprive me of. Um, and that turned out to be the grand sum of nothing. It was a bunch of worthless land in Nova Scotia, um, which today has a uh, the Halifax airport on it and a village of 4,000 people. So William was essentially written out of the estate. His daughter, Sally, he made, this is 50 years before the laws of coverture are finally ended. To Sally, he made sure she received the most valuable items in his estate, the most valuable monetary items. And he pointedly wrote, this is yours to hold alone. I want you to have independence of, of this, you know, financial independence. And he even thought to, to add a note to Sally's uh, husband, Franklin's son-in-law, saying, this doesn't lessen my opinion of you, but I want my daughter to have her own independent items and her own independent wealth. Then Franklin has two grandsons. One is William's son, Temple, who's sort of a, a roué, a, a cad, um, doesn't have a great reputation, and Franklin wants to redeem him. So he says, I'm leaving you all my papers and you're going to be literary executor. I want you to you know, put my papers together and, and make sure they're published. And this will redeem my reputation and yours. And Franklin, you know, Temple does not seem up to the task. It takes him nearly two decades to finally get those works published. And the last major heir was his beloved grandson, Benny, who was Sally's youngest son. Um, and to him, Franklin said, I think I've erred. You know, I, I, I never taught my other family members my trade. And so he trained Benny how to be a printer. And so to Benny, he leaves his printing press. And Benny becomes very much an advocate of a free press and becomes Adams and Washington's chiefest critic in the 1790s 
also had the colony's largest circulating newspaper. Adams and, and other critics of Benny dubbed him Lightning Rod Jr. And Benny would go on to um, become the first American arrested under the Alien and Sedition Acts. So that's the heirs, and I tell those stories in the book. But you're right, let's get to this amazing loan scheme that he left behind. You gave us a capsule description of it. What was it about this scheme that he developed that intrigued you so much to devote an entire book to it? Well, I think because, again, my mom is in construction and her dad worked for Ford Motor and my grandmother was a draftswoman, a technical drawer. And I think, you know, I'm sort of the, the failure of my family, becoming an English professor and not learning a trade or not working with my hands. Um, and when I read the will, I thought, well, this is really interesting because Franklin is, again, distancing himself from his fellow founders, who many of them are wealthy because of marriage. John Adams, George Washington, or they were lawyers by trade, or they considered themselves a new aristocracy. Franklin's very proud of the fact that he's a tradesperson and a printer. And the first line of his will is, I, Benjamin Franklin, printer. He starts with that. And I thought, okay, well, this is really interesting. He wants to differentiate, differentiate himself from his fellow founders. And at the same time, in the will, he says, it's, in my, it's my opinion that good apprentices make good citizens. And he made a point of saying early on that in order for our republic to survive, we need people who have their ear to the ground, who understand the effect of policy at the grassroot level of taxation, of legislation. Tradespeople, he said, circulate in a community. They interact with people of different classes, of different creeds, of different origins on a daily basis. These are the people we want in our government representing us. And so to that end, he said, just as I received help when I was a young printer from people who helped me buy out my printer, my partner and, and buy the Pennsylvania Gazette, I want to leave pots of money that will ensure that for the next 200 years, once you finish your apprenticeship, you can apply for a small loan from my fund here, and that will help you start your own business. Because he also believed that the only way to freedom in America and success was to be your own boss. But he really hoped that not only would these small loans stake these businesses, but that the people with those those borrowers would then go on and serve in public office. So uh, he divided it into two centuries, his death in 1790 to 1890, and then the second hundred years up until 1990, not all that long ago. And right. uh, and uh, I and you divide it in, in how the funds were managed during each of those centuries. So what did Franklin get right for that first hundred years? <laughs> and, and what was he unable to anticipate that made it challenging? That's a great question. I, I feel like I want to say no spoilers, but um, what he got right is that people would be interested in stepping forward and managing the loans. I mean, that was a real thing. You know, I, I was amazed when I read this that he said, OK, we're going to have this loan scheme for 200 years but it has to be managed for free. Someone's responsible to step forward and be willing to do this to help what he called the rising generation. Again, this is before professional money managers. I mean, the American economy was fledgling at the time. Um, there wasn't even a New York Stock Exchange until 1792, two years after he had died. So I was amazed that he got that right, that he was right. People would step forward and help him manage it. Now, what he got wrong is that they'd manage it well. Um, and the other thing that he got right is that apprentices would, in fact, say, yes, we want to take out these loans. This is great. This will, in fact, help us. Repaying a loan over 10 years at 5% does allow us to get a leg up and hang our shingle and start something. And he was right in that the repayments of the loan would, in fact, make the principle grow. I mean, Warren Buffett still adheres to this philosophy. He calls it the Methuselah technique. That compound interest is, in fact, a miracle. And if you don't touch money and just let it grow at a set percentage, uh, you will, in fact, have a windfall. Now, to what he got wrong, he assumed that borrowers were going to either be as industrious as he was or have as much luck as he did or had the benefits he did, like I said, with his wife, Deborah, and her work, and in Franklin's case, in slave labor. People after 1790 in Philadelphia and Boston didn't necessarily have the same conditions, especially after the abolition of slavery. And so Franklin got wrong that people would be as successful as he was. He also got wrong that people would pay back the money. He did not make any allowances in his scheme when his, he thought about what the money would turn into 
that people might renege on their loan. The biggest thing he got wrong is within 20 years of his death, the apprenticeship, the apprenticeship, apprenticeship, apprenticeship system, say that 10 times fast, as he knew it, is all but dismantled because it's the rise of the Industrial Revolution. He had seen a demonstration of a nascent steamboat in 1785, and he refused to invest in it. He didn't think it had a future. And again, you know, within 15 years, Robert Fulton's steamboat is taking settlers west. And then the Louisiana Purchase happens. And then Eli Whitney starts mechanization of not only the cotton gin, but manufacture of rifles. So America is spreading guns, gears, you know, what I call it in the book, I think it was steam, guns, steam, and guns, gears, and steam are, are eradicating Franklin's vision for what apprenticeship should be and how labor should be conducted. At the 100-year anniversary, the Franklin descendants come back into the picture in your story again, and in a very interesting character named George Pepper. Uh, can you uh, explain what the Franklin family was seeking to have done with the money at that point and how that all turned sure. out? You know, Alexis de Tocqueville had said that all American, pro- all American political problems end up being judicial ones. And he had said that, you know, the Declaration of Independence is... Uh, you know, essentially a grievance against the against King George III and the Constitution is a contract. Um, and in the end, Franklin's money just falls into lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. Now, I should w- tell readers that I make sure to breeze over these. I don't want to spend too much time in the courts. But one person that stepped forward was a young man in Philadelphia named George Wharton Pepper. And he probably endeared himself to Franklin's family because when he he graduated from the top of his class at Penn, the college that Franklin had co-founded, um, his his graduation speech to the assembled students was on a married woman's right to own property and have her own independence. And some of Franklin's descendants who hired him were renowned feminists for their in that era. And one woman. Um, Agnes uh, Irwin, excuse me, was the first dean of Radcliffe College. Uh, another woman was uh, a woman who had organized uh, sanitary fairs and had helped organize uh, relief supplies for Civil War troops for the Union side. And when Philadelphia was holding its great exhibition, you know, when it hosted the World's Fair, she had demanded that there be a woman's pavilion there. And when the organizers uh, refused, they said, OK, yeah, sure, we'll do that. Um, she after they didn't do it, she went ahead and had that pavilion built anyway. So the Franklin heirs decided, look, we don't think Philadelphia is managing the money correctly. And in Franklin's will, he said, if the money isn't being used in the methods that I set out, I want, uh, it should go to my surviving heirs. And so these Philadelphians, including Elizabeth Dwayne Gillespie, who I mentioned was organizing the Women's Pavilion at the Women's at the World Expo, and Agnes Irwin, came together and hired George Wharton Pepper. And Pepper said, well, I think we have a case here, actually. But what Pepper soon found out is he was arguing against the charitable use of Benjamin Franklin's money in Philadelphia before Philadelphia judges. And Pepper would not sit down. You know, he tried once, he tried a second time, he tried a third time. And it's amusing to read in his memoir as he talks about how stacked the case was against him and the family. Um, And in the end, he lost. But at the same time, he said he won because becoming so intimate with Franklin's bequests and knowing the Franklin family so well. Decades later, a white haired George Wharton Pepper ends up defending uh, Franklin's uh, bequest and changing the terms to allow more people to use it, including women, for the first time. You know, we've never established dollar figures, but by this point at the centennial, how much had Franklin's original bequest through the miracle of compound interest grown to? (laughs) Not nearly as much as he had thought, but it had done quite well, Um, enough to build something really big. And this was the problem for Boston and Philadelphia when the the centennial of his death came around. It's, you know, I think Boston's at that time was a quite deal. Uh, it wasn't as much as Franklin had thought, but we were into the millions at this point. Um, I don't want to give out exact figures because it's so hard to give equivalencies for historical money. 
Um, but certainly at Boston's at that time, it was within, you know, tens of millions um, in equivalency, if not hundreds of millions. In Philadelphia, it was in the tens of millions for its equivalency. But then the big fight began. What do we do with this money? You know, a chunk of it is supposed to build something for the common good. And Franklin, I think, quite mischievously had said, talk it out amongst yourselves. You have to decide democratically uh, what it is you want to build. So in the eight or nine minutes we have left, the second century led to two institutions, one in each of the cities. In Philadelphia, the, the Franklin Institute, which people can vi visit today. In Boston, uh, a trades college. So uh, the cities differed, but uh, which one of them really evoked Franklin's spirit, do you think, the best? <laughs> Boy, that's another tough question, because you have these, these, these streams are constantly crossing, which like, what city did better at lending its money to workers? That's definitely Philadelphia. But what city, and this is tough because anybody listening to this from the Franklin Institute or a child who has been to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia or even a Philadelphian, I got to be careful, would say, no, 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 the Franklin Institute is the better use of the money. I have to say, though, that visiting what became the ben now is called the Benjamin Franklin Institute of Technology in Boston South End, to me, best invokes Franklin's spirit. And not just because when you walk in the doors of this story building, there's murals uh, along the uh, along the 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 top of the ceiling of, of the, the lobby showing scenes from Franklin's life with great Franklin quotes about, you know, uh, I've never seen a, a man happier than a person with tools and so forth. He who hath the trade hath an estate and so on. But you walk through that school and you see young people learning trades and they're not sitting at their desk passively. They're working on 3D printers, they're welding, they're wrenching. And this, the, the president of the school at that time, I'd visit the school several times over the research of the book, kept saying to me, like, the, the principles of learning a trade in Franklin's time to our time really have not changed that much. You're trying to solve a problem to help a customer, to make something more efficient, to make something work better. And he was saying that, you know, people keep asking me, like, oh, we have the fourth industrial revolution right now and robots are taking over. He said, well, we're training students to fix the robots. There's always going to be a use for our graduates here even though many people don't think of their graduates until their air conditioning breaks or until a door needs repairing, right? Uh, but he said, you know, to me, walking through these halls and looking in these classrooms, I'm really seeing us creating the middle class. And that's a revolutionary act in this country, he said. I visited the website for the Ben Franklin Trades Institute, and I, I noticed that they recently changed their name to the Franklin Cummings Institute. I thought that was illustrative of the story that you tell because they obviously had to bring in another sponsor to help support the future of the school. And all along the way, his money seemed to be never quite enough to do uh, something that would last for posterity. It never was quite enough. And Andrew Carnegie had stepped in. You know, Frank, among Franklin's most favorite adventures was the matching grant, which he invented to fund the construction of the Pennsylvania Hospital. And so when Boston was trying to use its centennial gift, and this took over a decade with many lawsuits, um, they finally struck upon building a trade school, but they didn't have enough money because the money, Franklin's money would build the trade school, but it wouldn't manage its operating costs. And Andrew Carnegie famously stepped forward and said, I'll match Ben Franklin. And that's how that school was built. And it is, you know, throughout its existence, and I track this throughout the book, it's always been on a shoestring budget. It's always been in the red. It's completely different than Harvard across the Charles River with its $40 billion plus dollar endowment. Um, and I think it's a little sad, actually, that it did take a single gift of not very much, frankly, we're talking about giving to a school, $12.5 million the Cummings Family the Foundation gave uh, to make sure that the Franklin Institute will have enough money to move. They're moving to Roxbury to a new modern campus to keep pace with the need of modern trades. But at the same time, and again, I didn't spend $12.5 million, so I'm treading lightly here when I say this, Franklin did not name his philanthropy after himself. And Carnegie did. And so this isn't to put the Cummings Family Foundation on the hook, as it were. But Franklin was adamant that his name should not go on his inventions. He's considered a forerunner of the open source movement. He never took out an exclusive commercial license. This is before patents. Patents started in 1790 for his inventions, including the lightning rod, bifocals, and so forth. He felt that I benefit from technology and invention, so I want other people to benefit from mine as well. He never put his name on his philanthropic projects. 
someone walking in Philadelphia in the 1770s and 1780s could have walked by the Franklin Academy and the Franklin Fire Brigade and the Franklin Gazette and poor Benjamin's Almanac and the Franklin Insurance Company and the Franklin Militia and the Franklin Battery, on and on and on. He didn't do that. The Franklin Library, we could keep going. Um, and in fact, John Adams, you know, when he had visited Philadelphia, said, oh, pff, it's nothing compared to Boston, except they have a really nice market and they have much better charitable foundations. <laughs> and had Adams known that Franklin has, was the one behind a lot of those, maybe he would have changed his mind. But I think were Franklin alive today, he'd be really gladdened to see his money still funding trades, you know, kids who want to learn trades in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania. He'd be really glad and to see that his money helped build the Franklin Institute. And that's still operating today. Wonderful science museum and classrooms. He'd be, I think, ecstatic to see the Franklin Trade School still running in Boston. Would he wonder why it has someone else's name on it? Maybe, but he'd probably also wonder, hey, why does it have my name on it? Right. So I don't think maybe in the end he'd shrug and say, hey, this is great that it's still running. Michael Meyer, before we started, I told you I'd pulled one quote from your book to read to you for comment. It's from page 158. Here goes. Franklin hoped his last will and testament would persuade Americans to follow his example. The dying wishes of his fellow founders, Washington, Hamilton, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison, only amplify the uniqueness of this request, as well as their shared moral failings. It can be hard to appreciate what a radical step this was. While in life, these six men grappled with the question, what does America mean? Only Franklin felt compelled to continue his answer from the grave. Expound on that for me as we close here. You know, here's a man that is suffering from pleurisy, uh, is in a great deal of pain from a kidney stone. He's 83 years old, withering away in a bed, and he writes movingly to his friends, you know, the, the, the illnesses I'm having are making me lose my appetite. I'm taking these horrible mixers like Daffy's Elixir to horrible things of lye and, and soap. Um, that he's drinking down and trying to relieve the pain. He's wasting away. He's just a skeleton. And here he is in the months before he dies. He remembers this satiric essay that a French admirer had written to him in Paris saying, wouldn't it be funny if there was a guy named Fortunate Richard and he's going to take some of his money and put it in account with it, after compound interest, after 100 years and 200 years, could fund skilled workers to have their own businesses. And Franklin writes to this Frenchman and says, you'll be happy to know I've taken up your idea. And I just love this notion that Franklin at that moment in 1789 is deciding my dying words to my country, if it survives, the bet I'm placing on it is that the skilled trades class, the leather apron class, which he proudly counted himself a member, not only needs to survive, but it's crucial to the survival of our Republic that those working class voices participate in our democracy. Michael Meyer, Benjamin Franklin's Last Bet is the name of your book. Its subtitle is The Favorite Founder's Divisive Death, Enduring Afterlife, and Blueprint for American Prosperity. Thanks for joining us on C-SPAN. It was an honor. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast, so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome. 